City Conversations. City Conversations is presented by SFU Public Square. We want to thank our sponsors, SFU Vancouver, Bing Tong Architects, the SFU City Program, and Wild Rice Restaurants. For those who are new to City Conversations, and there are a lot of people here today who are attending for the first time, uh, this is kind of a formal uh, classroom, but uh, but we are not formal in that respect. We do not have speakers and an audience here. We have presenters and participants, and you are the participants. Presenters will briefly frame the conversation. We have four today, so they're going to uh, be in two teams, and. Uh, each will have a maximum of 10 minutes, so get a moment of warning if, uh, if, they, if they start to push their time. But then it turns over to you. Uh, for those of you who have bought, brought your lunches, we encourage that. It's not room to eat your lunch. This is a lunchtime event, a noontime event. Our topic today is the changes proposed by the city staff to the point grade and, uh, and York Avenue Grove Corridor, which is the connection between the Burrard Bridge and Jericho Beach, the last chunk of the uh, seawall route, 28 uh, kilometers, uh, the last uh, portion which has not been completed. <coughs> Options for improvement have been discussed for a very long time and uh, and frequently generated much local opposition uh, and very few changes. To frame the conversation, to frame the conversation, um, I'm actually going to take a moment because there were changes announced as recently as this morning, but particularly yesterday, the uh, city did its, uh, the city staff issued its final report to council, which council will be taking up, uh, I believe, in, in, in about a week. Uh, so, uh, I abstracted some of the information from that uh, very lengthy report just to give people who are, uh, are not completely familiar with the area what the proposal looks like. This is the study area. Uh, this is the study area uh, running from uh, the, uh, roughly the Burrard Bridge uh, out to Jericho uh, <coughs> Park. And this is the city's stated objective to, uh, uh, for, for this project. These, this is the final proposal. Uh, different sections in one uh, yeah. running to Jericho Beach. Uh, they want to improve sidewalks and add a separated uh, and add separated bike lanes on the north side. 2A is the stretch along uh, Point Grey Road, that, uh, which would be turned from an arterial to a local street. It would be one way eastbound from Alma to Waterloo, and it would be closed at Church and, and at McDonald to allow parks to, that are on both sides of the street to be uh, combined with just a pedestrian and bicycle path. Uh, running through the area, not cars. Uh, sidewalks would, would be improved. There would be expanded green space, as I uh, explained. Uh, Church Creek would be uh, daylighted, and uh, beach access would be provided. Uh, the third section uh, would have improved sidewalks and a separated bike lane on the north side with a signal at Stevens, running from Stevens all the way to uh, along York, running. Uh, from Stevens all the way to, uh, to Cyprus, uh, York will become a, a uh, quiet street with, still with cars, but with each block alternating in its direction. So it's one way eastbound and one way westbound, so that only uh, uh, the access will really primarily be for residents and their visitors, separated bike lanes uh, running through. So there, that would complete the connection to the uh, Burrard Bridge. I'm not going to get into the details of the changes proposed for uh, the south end of the Burrard Bridge. Uh, those were just released today. I don't even know if they're posted. One. 
This is what Point Grey would look li uh, looks like at the top uh, today, and what it would look like uh, uh, as proposed uh, by the city. And this is where the, uh, the through traffic would be blocked. There would be a, uh, uh, a turnaround uh, for cars. And uh, let's go on, please. Uh, and you can see in the lower. Uh, as you can see in the, in the uh, lower uh, diagram how the turnarounds uh, work and good traffic for cyclists and pedestrians uh, go through the park and the park is then stretch completely across. Uh, traffic, big concern. Uh, existing situation is that along Point Grey Road, there are about 10,000 cars a day according to the city's uh, count of through traffic. That does not mean people reaching their homes along Point Grey Road. That means people traveling along Point Grey Road to reach another destination, typically UBC. Uh, significant numbers actually coming from the North uh, Shore. Uh, uh, that's about 10,000 per day, and about a third of them, slightly more than a third of them, come from outside uh, Vancouver or UBC. Uh, the projected group would change that so that there will be a reduction of 10,000 along Point Grey Road and along Alma between uh, 4th Avenue and Point Grey Road. Uh, but 7,000 cars would then, an additional 7,000 cars would then come down McDonald Street and then redistribute themselves uh, along 4th Avenue, Broadway, and as far as 12th and 16th Avenue. So uh, rather than using the uh, coastal route, they would now be uh, using more commercial uh, streets. Okay. Uh, McDonald, of course, then uh, becomes uh, a, kind of a, a significant issue, and I know that uh, people on McDonald are not happy about it. Uh, the, the increase would be 10,000 uh, vehicles per day on McDonald, which would uh, bring it to a total of 17,000 per day. Uh, that's a uh, street, typical of streets in Vancouver, and uh, there are other streets in Vancouver that have <coughs> that level of traffic according to the city. So with that, that's just the, uh, the basics. With that, we're going to turn this over to, let's go back to the second um, uh, to our presenters today. So to frame the conversation, I'm really pleased to have four residents of the uh, neighborhood. Uh, two supporters of the city plan are Peter Ladner, uh, a former city councilor and MPA mural candidate, and Pamela McCall, who has been gathering supporting signatures now for a very long time. Um, George Seslia uh, is a concerned uh, Point Grey Road resident, and Dwayne Nickel uh, uh, is a resident of 6th Avenue and, he says, a former uh, professional bike racer. Uh, who are concerned about the implementation of the program. Uh, I believe uh, George and uh, Dwayne are going to go first. Here we Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dwayne Nickel, and uh, just before I start talking, I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to come down here. This is an issue that affects a lot of people in my neighborhood, and I can see by the number of people here that there's a lot of concern, and hopefully we can get through this as a, uh, as a dialogue. Um, I'm a resident uh, computer geek in uh, Kitsilino. I work in data analyst, and I've been very skilled at being able to crunch numbers my whole life. This is uh, part of what's led me to look at this issue and kind of bring out some facts, but I'm more interested in hearing some of your concerns. Uh, I myself am removing my own desires. Uh, I am a cyclist. Um, I'm removing my own desires from wanting it or not wanting it out of the equation. I'm here to facilitate listening to your concerns and working with others to help bring about a consensus. Um, before I start, there's some considerations. A lot of people have put a ton of work into this. Um, I'd ask that everyone here be respectful and refrain from personal attacks, no matter what side of the equation you're on. And uh, keep an open mind. Um, there's certain outcomes of this that are difficult to predict. You can model traffic, you can look at the data and analyze it, but there's always uh, 
uh, you know, ghosts in the machine, things that will catch you by surprise. And understand that I think everyone in the room is acting in good faith. We all have concerns that a lot of them are legitimate. Um, we share a lot of the common goals. Um, I think all of us want uh, Vancouver to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to, as a motorist, hit a cyclist or as a, a cyclist, meet it. I was here on a bike in Alaska in uh, July 16th, uh, actually a year ago, a year ago almost today. It changed my life uh, dramatically. Um, the city land use that we're looking at right now also is something that we can't always look at in a microcosm like we are right now when we're planning solutions for the long-term overall uh, welfare of the city. Um, we have to take into account that we're part of a region and there's regional demands on land use. Um, when I ran as a provincial MLA candidate, uh, I was part of a lot of the SFU transportation discussions. And we realized that things like streetcars, uh, trans light rapid transit, uh, all kinds of uh, vehicles and commuters are all valid forms of transportation in all 50 different kinds. It's important to have all the stakeholders uh, present. George and I are for cycling safety. Um, the work and process uh, to date uh, has yielded some good results, but it's also uh, brought up some assumptions that need to be clarified and some details that need uh, additional clarification. As you just saw, one example was on this uh, map where you saw 10,000 cars a day and they're going to go down McDonald's, 7,000 of them. It was spoken of as if those 10,000 cars are equally distributed every few hours around the clock. I would highly suspect that that's not true, so it might be good to look at the raw data. It might be possible that out of the 10,000 cars, 5,000 of them travel down that corridor in as little as three and a half hours. It's a very real possibility. Um, there's also a lot of people who come to me and, and express a concern that um, they feel that this is going a little bit fast. And yes, I acknowledge there has been a process, and the process has gone on for many years. Um, still, um, I never got a postcard in my door. Um, if people here feel disenfranchised, I think it's good to listen to them and understand what the concerns are. And I hope that people will speak up in this, uh, this uh, dialogue and bring together a way that we can build consensus. Um, today's goals are, to, again, to listen to any outstanding concerns about the plan. Uh, all the plan is online, it's been online for quite a while. Um, and then to work to address and mitigate as much of it as possible. Um, I'd like to keep out of scope for today's conversation, any conversation about reckless cyclists or motorists exceeding laws. We already have uh, speed limits, we have existing laws for that. Um, not trying to fix any processes today, it's just to reduce the fear, uncertainty, and doubt of the fight. Um, some of the data that was presented to me where I said, hmm, this doesn't align with what I saw. I saw one uh, statement that ICBC records show 143 crashes on the stretch of road between 2005 to 2009, uh, with two-thirds resulting in an injury or fatality. When I contacted ICBC and got an email back from them, uh, they did confirm that, in fact, there was a roughly 43 crashes involving cyclists between 2008 and 2012. Now, I know these are different time periods, so you can't compare them directly. Um, Safety has been cited as one of the reasons for this, yet between this stretch and highway between uh, Alma on Point Grey and Trafalgar for five years, there's been zero crashes involving a bicycle reported to ICBC. And that's the, uh, the link for it. I'll leave that up online. Uh, for um, public consultation, uh, there has been public consultation. The numbers on the, the website uh, vary a bit. Um, I think it's, it's uh, less relevant now that we're all in a room talking about uh, how we're going to move forward with this. Um, some of the concerns that I've had personally, and again, I speak only for myself. I don't speak for any organization of citizens. I don't speak for any specific blocks. I don't speak for any political group or agenda. Um, my concerns are that there are discrepancies in data, and maybe sitting down and looking at those can lead to reconciling that data. Uh, some of the data is insufficient for data modeling. Um, that may be mitigated by rolling out the plan in phases, and I think the city has in fact uh, stated that that's what they're doing. Uh, that may mitigate uh, the uh, ability to not understand what the uh, impact of some of those may be. Um, George is going to get up and illustrate one of the points he uncovered. And uh, the last concern is I'm, I'm a, a bit of an environmentalist, and stop and start traffic actually does lead to more greenhouse gases being emitted into the environment. Um, hopefully, this gets mitigated as we have a better regional traffic transit uh, capacity.
city planned uh, more environmentally friendly ways, but for the short term, it's possible that shortening traffic could lead to more greenhouse gases being emitted. At this point, I'll invite George up to uh, talk about some specific areas. So what I want to do, hopefully you can see it, one of the concerns here is not, will there be a bike lane? The question is, how does it get implemented? And how does it get implemented safely? So I said, the way you design things is you go to an analogy. The best analogy we have in the city is the Hornby Street bike lane. The green line represents Pacific on the bottom, Hastings on the top. It's roughly 10 blocks. Every block is roughly 150 meters, call it 1,500 meters. There are only seven crossings of that bike lane in that existing area. Many have one, only one has two, and four have zero. This is the current situation today. It's on a straight line. So that's a situation that we're very familiar with today. My concern, and this is right in, right out, no left ins, no left outs. If we will go to the next slide, this is a current picture looking westbound. This is Trafalgar this way, Point Grey Road this way, around the curve is Stevens. The rough distance between Trafalgar and Stevens is also roughly 150 meters. Now, somebody may go measure and say, no, one is 162 and this is 148. I took this off of Google. So for kind of practical purposes, call it apples to apples, 150 to 150. It may be a spark for Macintosh, but I think it's order of magnitude. The city proposal as it stands today is to eliminate those two north lanes. So if you, no, go back a So if you are coming westbound on Point Grey and you want to access your driveway in the 26 or 2700 block, you now have to cross a bike lane going eastbound, a bike lane going westbound, and an enlarged sidewalk. I think the real issue here is how do people share the road? We want to make sure that there's safety for everybody. We'll go to the next slide. This shows now the number of driveways on either side of the So Unfortunately, it's out of, out of focus, but you can see where the zero, the two is, this is uh, balsam, so there's two on the north side, one on the south side. If you go to Larch, there's zero on the north, zero on the south. There are six on the north side between Trafalgar and Stevens. And there are another four on the north side between Stevens and McDonald and six. So the practical issue to me is, why not eliminate conflict? Who would want to be either in a car, in a bicycle, walking, or like my elderly parents who are now going to have problems because all the parking gets eliminated, they can actually park off the park two blocks over, and they will have to do that. So we want something that says, you need safe design. The city on Comox Street at the Century Plaza Hotel for one bike for one crossing has now redesigned it twice. They couldn't get it right. How are they going to do six? Dwayne? Yeah, just to close up, probably up about 30 seconds. Um, these are just some questions um, we'd like to consider and talk about today. Um, you know, do the proposals minimize the conflict between our road users? Um, certainly, uh, there's some good points to some of them. There are also some areas that need attention. Um, and mainly, what do you think? Should we proceed, or does this feel like it is going a bit too fast? Yeah, that's Hello everyone. I am um, here because I started working on this two years ago and I was able to uh, go around my neighborhood between McDonald and Alma, Point Grey Road and Ford, including the businesses, and talk to people about this issue of safety and access. And because I did that, and I was able to get 2,200 people um, to support this, and also to go to meetings with Hub and find their support with now over 1,500 people, I believe, um, I actually can speak with some level of um, credibility. I speak as an individual, but I also represent all the people that signed a legal petitions 
that was vetted by the city for accuracy. Every single thing in the preamble is factual, which is a very important part of the petition because anything in a preamble that is misleading of the public makes the entire petition null and void. And so we went to that, through that process to make sure that we weren't in any way misinforming the public. I also um, live on Prairie Road, and I uh, was alarmed at the amount of uh, accidents and uh, near misses and screeching of cars and, and pedestrians and everybody else. It's just, it was just an un, un, unacceptable situation for everybody who uses it. But when I got into this more and I actually talked to the city, I realized that, and I read the urban planning report from UBC that was done in 2011 by Professor Frank. I found that it's not only unsafe, it's so, it's perceived as unsafe, and so it's not being used to its full capacity. And that was the final recommendation of Professor Frank from, University, from the urban planning department, was that its recreational potential is not being maximized because it's an unsafe, it's a perception of unsafe um, transportation route. So, the city of Vancouver, um, with their engineers, who are um, very well regarded around the world, these people have been working for the city, some of them for 20 years. They are extremely professional and respected. And I am not an engineer. So I look to them and an elected government for guidance on issues like this. I very much think that the public process and civic engagement is an opportunity for an individual to speak to their government. That's what it's designed to do. It's been doing, we've been doing this in Canada for 30 years. It is not an opportunity for a mid-term election campaign. It is not an opportunity for political opponents to seize hold of a public conversation and turn it around for their benefit. And it is not an opportunity for special interest groups and stakeholders to intimidate the public to buy them the opportunity to have this discussion openly and safely in their own neighborhoods. And it is not an opportunity for wealthy people to fund hired guns, hire marketing companies, media campaigns, and do what they've done in this discussion. I find that rude, I find it offensive as an individual, <coughs> and I think that it's not the kind of democracy that we want to support. These people should be called out and they should be challenged on it. They have manipulated the media, they have put up false statements, and I don't think this is all fair. I think that this conversation about transportation is what we should be talking about. Not Gregor Robertson, not Vision. It's about how I get from Kids Beach to Jericho and the thousands of young people who are doing this. UBC has just hired a full-time employee to do nothing but advocate for bike commuter use. She wants people to get on their bike and commute to UBC from all over the city. We have to have safe routes for that to happen. The city is on track. These professional engineers have designed a program that see, has seen 40% more bike traffic in this city since 2008. They are going to reach their goal of sustainable modes of transportation, helping the planet in Vancouver. I mean, this is what we're trying to do here. And I'll just wrap up one last thing. 30% of all gases put in vehicles is for journeys that are under three miles of duration. If we actually encourage sustainable modes of transportation, we can really make a difference to the planet. And that's really the bigger picture here. And that's really why I'm so passionate about it. Because I want to see people out there. I have children who ride bikes. They do not own cars. And for all the people I surveyed in Kitts Beach, all these young people, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, they don't own cars either. And they all supported this petition readily. They gave down their data, their emails, their phone numbers, their private information. Totally happy to do it, support this program. And in doing that, this whole process of a public petition enfranchised all these people who maybe don't vote, but they might because they actually feel they were part of this process. And I think that's one of the best things about what we did, was we got all these young kids to think that, hey, when I see these improvements go in, I actually had a say in that, and I helped. So that's all I'm going to Um, special welcome to Councillor Affleck and Councillor Deal and Councillor Carr. Were there any other councillors here? <laughs> the former city council, I know it's, they're, they're very busy and uh, it's great. Yeah, if we could have the council meeting now. <laughs> 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 I want to uh, talk about the bigger picture. I mean, this is a conversation and I think uh, there's some other things that we should be talking about that 
don't get talked about when we get tied up in detail about this particular intersection or that particular roadway. And that is just, it seems like in every city in North America and, and, I, and in Europe, when cycling improvements are brought up, there's just a really heated, hostile debate that kicks in. And I think it's, under, un, it's important to understand that debate because I'm going to estimate that about 50, I'm going to be really conservative here, about 50% of the discussion about this is actually kind of a meta discussion. There's a, there's a bigger, darker, other issues that are going on that are never discussed and it's disguised as I'm concerned about my, uh, my driveway or whatever it is. Um, and I want to just talk a bit about that. First thing is to look at the picture of the city. We do not have a choice of improving our transportation by enabling more cars to move. We don't have them. We don't have a place to put them, and we will create congestion and problems and pollution and so on if we do that. We have to use other forms of transportation, and that's why for 20, 30 years ago, we've had a transportation policy that um, walking, transit, and cycling take precedence over vehicle use. So that's at play here. And I think a lot of people would take issue with that, and it's, in fact, their issue with this issue, with this route is that they don't believe that or want that to happen. And that's just gonna happen because there's no other choice. Um, why is there a culture of conflict? Um, cycling in cities today, it's, in many cases, it's unproven, it's changing, it's disruptive. People are gonna lose their parking spaces or their easy access they used to have or the route that they used to have. And, to borrow uh, Dwayne's phrase, change brings fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so it's quite understandable that people are getting riled up about these things. I think drivers resent cyclists because they have, cyclists have, like it or not, a moral high road. They are, in some cases, it's cleaner, quieter, healthier, better for the city, better for them, better for the communities they ride in. The cyclists on their side flaunt this and kind of think they can do whatever they want because they're better than everybody else. And they can you know, drive without big traffic signs and all the rest. That <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that the drivers understand the extent of the public, uh, the public funding that goes into the car driving. Uh, you often hear these damn cycles, why don't they pay something? I pay all these taxes for my gas. Rate. In fact, car drivers pay maybe 40 or 60 percent of their total costs, and the rest is subsidized by the public. But drivers don't see that, they don't understand it, and they resent the fact that cyclists don't seem to be paying it. Mm -hmm. I think that um, cycling the way we have it in our cities today is still uh, a very kind of elite thing. People are, the people who do it are, tend to be fit, they tend to be younger, they tend to be um, just more sort of uh, not like everybody else. Cycling is something they do is I'm a cyclist. I'm not just someone who gets around and happens to use a bicycle. I'm a different kind of person. Uh, there is inconvenience when you put a bike lane in. There are changes that happen and people do get inconvenienced. And they have every right to be unhappy about that. And people will say, well, you know, this is not a solution. It's not going to work. Think I can't, well, I can't ride to work. It's, I can't take it's too far. I'm unhealthy. It's, doesn't, I don't have safe routes. So why are they saying everybody should be riding bikes? Because it's not going to work everywhere. So it's just, it doesn't work. And then there's some other curious ones to me that cycling, I think in some people's minds, is for losers, drug dealers, and children. <laughs> <laughs> that it's, that it's, a, it's a, something that the Lord has <laughs> saying that anybody in this room has these feelings. I'm just saying there is an element of that. Cycling is going backwards. When we go forwards, we get into comfortable cars where we can control the weather, we can control the temperature, we can control who we're with, and we can drive where we want and when we want. Get, getting back to cycling, we got over that. We're not peasants anymore. Look what happened in China. We went through all this. Finally, uh, the people who are promoting the automobile industry, lifestyle, own the media, plain and simple. So how are we gonna fix this? First thing is we gotta get data. We gotta deal with actual facts. The facts are that bike routes are good for business. That is the data. There are all kinds of impressions to the country. The data does not say that. The facts are that more people on cycles, bicycles, relieve congestion, they improve health outcomes, they reduce healthcare costs for everybody. 
We also have to get cyclists into protected, safer, connected bike lanes where they're not in the way of cars, where they're not interfering with people's lives, and they're not pissing off drivers. We also have to make cycling attractive to all ages and abilities, so it's not just for extreme people who can brave traffic and who can ride very safely in all conditions and up all kinds of hills. We have to make it more convenient than driving so it becomes a practical choice for people. And finally, we have to tone down the rhetoric on both sides. Finally, I want to just call out Chilco Street. I don't know how many of you were around in the 1970s, but Art Phillips closed Chilco Street. He used to drive off the Lionsgate Bridge, come around the Lost Lagoon, take a ride at Chilco, go straight through to Pacific, and go to English Bay. It had about the same number of cars as Point Bear Road has now. It's a through street on a residential area in Arturo. It was blocked off. There was a huge outcry. There were meetings like this. Today, it's for local traffic only, multi-use, cycles, walking, people driving to and from their deliveries, whatever they're doing. <coughs> nobody misses it, nobody regrets it, and nobody would dream of bringing through traffic again through the West End. So I think that's what's going to happen on Frontier Road. I think it's going to work out well, and I'm really excited about the prospect of seeing it. <coughs>